Uh, so this talk is SignalR above and beyond chat. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I'm really excited about SignalR and uh, hopefully you'll find out why very soon. My name is David Pine. I'm a Microsoft MVP and Google developer expert. Uh, so there's about 700 plus Google developer experts around the globe and over 3,000 MVPs. Uh, but I've only met two others that hold both at the same time, so it's a super, uh, super gratifying feeling to have that recognition from two awesome companies. So I'm excited about that. You can follow me on Twitter at DavidPine7, and then also I maintain a blog at DavidPine.net where I blog about all the things, so check that out. Uh, one thing I like to preface my talks with is that I love the developer community, so who's, just show of hands, who does Twitter? Who's seen the developer community hashtag? That's a hashtag you should watch for. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of it. Uh, my story is that back in 2016, I first started speaking, and I was terrified. It, there's always like an adrenaline rush, and getting up in front of a crowd and putting yourself out there and potentially feeling like you're gonna be judged, right? There's this innate sense of imposter syndrome that hits you, and you feel like a lesser individual. But afterwards, right, after you've done it enough, it's really awesome, it's really great, and it's something that I think every single one of you here today in attendance could absolutely do. So I hope that you do it, because for me, the developer community has been something I could lean on. I've been taking from it for so long that I've decided to give back. So with that, let's jump into SignalR. SignalR, uh, so it's open source. Are there any open source developers in the room today? And by that I mean like, active on potentially you know, GitHub, looking at the various uh, source code that's available out there? No, no, show of hands, couple of people? Okay, um, so open source is, there's a community there also, right? So the developer community isn't just presenters or people who blog or answer questions on Stack Overflow, there's a community within open source. So open source is amazing for lots of reasons, you can do lots of things with it, right? You can see how things are made. You can see how others interact, their design patterns. You can learn from them, be humbled by them, uh, and then also provide back. You can do pull requests, you can fork and branch and do all these things, and it's really amazing. And I think it's awesome that Microsoft pivoted and made so many things open source. So SignalR is offering up real-time web functionality. And by that, I mean it's enabling uh, server and client uh, interaction. So it's a duplex communication. So what that actually does is the server can send unsolicited messages to the client. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, but it's also duplex so that the client can do the same to the server. So the benefits, when we start thinking about the benefits of SignalR, I have three young sons. And whenever we do family trips, we travel, it's, it's interesting, because they're always like, are we there yet, right? Show of hands if you have kids. You've heard that, are you there yet? So right, imagine the typical web server request response pipeline. It's very similar to kids asking, are we there yet, on a family vacation trip. So the kids will say, are we there yet? No, are we there yet? No, are we there yet? No, and then eventually you're there and you're like, this is great, right? We're there. They, you know, get the information that we're having the vacation. It's finally, you know, all the anticipation is built up. The same is true with requests and responses within webs, right? So rather than having a client browser say, do you have information for me yet? Do you have information for me yet? And then the server saying, nope, nope, nope. Okay, now I have information. Here it is. Uh, this is, this is one of the benefits of SignalR, right? So it alleviates that concern. So use cases are real-time all the things. So think about, uh, you know, obviously in the name of this talk, we're talking about a chat application, but we're gonna go far beyond just chat. But chat is a great example because who uses Slack? Everyone? Who uses Skype? Who uses Teams? Who uses something else? Okay. So that's a real-time those are, you know, if it's not, if you're not using it, the, the desktop client or mobile app, typically that's a real-time web functionality that's enabled by 
a technology similar to SignalR, right, where things happen in real time. So there's other use cases for it as well beyond that. Um, imagine like collaborating on a whiteboard or uh, stock ticker, things of that nature. And it's everywhere you want to be because the web is everywhere. So SignalR uh, has been around for a very long time as it pertains to ASP.NET framework. What we're talking about today is SignalR Core, right? So ASP.NET Core came around, and then uh, it's, it's like a rewrite of that in, uh, initial uh, vision of SignalR. So there's various platforms that this can be consumed on. So uh, with ASP.NET Core, that's, your, that's where you're gonna host it, you're gonna be the, you're the server, and then you'll have different clients that can connect to that. So some of the platforms that exist today are the JavaScript client, I put in parentheses, uh, IE 11, because that's where it's at for IE. Uh, everything else, you know, browser-wise, it'll just work. There's the .NET client, so I think about iOS and Android, right, Xamarin, and stuff like that. There's a Java client, right? So that's pretty cool. There's also a C++ uh, client that's in the works. They're targeting that for the 3.0 release of .NET Core. And then there's a third-party implementation for Swift. So there's seemingly endless ways to consume this. So let's take a look at this. So with ASP.NET Core, there was a bunch of uh, naming conventions that were introduced, you know, kind of following what existed before with the this notion of a startup, right? Think uh, Owen Quintana. Uh, so we have a startup, and then we have configure services. Within configure services, you have an I uh, service collection. And this is how we wire up dependency injection. And dependency injection is a first class citizen of ASP.NET Core. So this is very typical. So we'll walk up to the services and we'll say dot add signal R. And this will add all the signal R services that are required for us to start consuming it. Uh, also, we have configure, and this is where you explicitly say how you want to use those services, right? So we'll say app.useSignalR, and then we have a routes uh, object, and we're going to map our hub. So when we say map hub, this is a uh, strongly typed C-sharp subclass of hub, and hub is a type that's provided by SignalR. So we have a chat hub here, and we're mapping it to the chat endpoint, okay? Pretty straightforward. So we're a few lines of code into it, and we can you know, basically already wire up for dependency injection the consumption of an endpoint that maps to our strongly typed chat hub that will allow us to do some very interesting things. So you have to think to yourself, right, if we're hosting an app, um, imagine that we're hosting uh, like a, a website and then we also want to have SignalR in there, you might start thinking, well, how do we handle scalability, right? If we have tens of thousands of users, what can we do to offput the concern for scalability? So we start thinking about the cloud. And Azure has recently added uh, a first-class citizen um, of SignalR as a service in the cloud. So to add SignalR, the Azure service, you just say dot add Azure SignalR, right? And then that will handle all of the uh, scalability for you. And you can configure that as you would any other uh, Azure service. So that additional line of code is all that's gonna be needed. So let's talk about transports. Uh, transports are the mechanism in which the client and the server communicate. So it's the technology underneath. So typically you're gonna prefer WebSockets as its most performance. The best transport is automatically chosen based on the server uh, and client's capabilities, right? So it'll just fall back. One thing that's different from ASP.NET Core's version of SignalR versus what was uh, in the framework years ago, uh, they, they had originally fallen back to forever frame. This is no longer available. So, if the client doesn't support WebSockets, but the server does, um, but the client does support server sent events, 
and the server does. That'll be the transport that's chosen for that uh, communication. So I have a demo. This is demo one of three, a fairly ambitious talk before lunch, I might say. So we're going to start talking about the chat app. And fair warning, spoiler alert, many of you have potentially seen uh, what Microsoft has presented for the, the you know, previous uh, several major events where they talk about, here's SignalR Core, here's a chat application with Vue.js. So I took it a bit further and uh, just kind of explored what was possible. So within our startup, uh, before I continue, can everyone in the back see? Is the, the contrast good? The font size? Everything's, okay, good. So we have a startup class. We configure services. We add our authentication. We add some chat services. Let's go take a look at these services specifically because those are kind of nice to highlight. In our chat application, I decided to add a hosted service. And a hosted service was also a new concept introduced in ASP.NET Core where it lets you in proc run a background service, right? So we can have something running outside of the context of the request response pipeline that's just always running, okay? And in this case, I added a chat bot service because it's fairly difficult to demonstrate in front of a live audience a chat application if you're not having anyone on the other end, right? So I've got a chat bot service that I can chat to. So then we say add SignalR and then add Azure SignalR. And then as mentioned before, we'll uh, use SignalR. And in this case, I'm still using the Azure SignalR here. Uh, this wasn't, uh, with .NET 3.0, this is not gonna be needed. Uh, so I'm using some older bits and I decided not to risk updating my preview stuff to the latest. So we have a very simple Razor Pages application. So this isn't MVC, this is Razor Pages. So it's still using the Razor View Engine. So we get our very familiar looking HTML, CS HTML files, and we can do uh, data binding and stuff like that. So in this particular case, we have a uh, chat element, and we have a transition group, and we're doing some little animations here with a list, and we have some pretty CSS. So we'll have some list items, right? And we're using Vue.js, as I mentioned before, so we have some binding syntax. We can iterate over our messages that are coming in, and we'll take a look at the Vue.js app in just a second. Um, and then we have the capability to post messages from here, and this markup, as I mentioned, is pretty straightforward. So over here we have our JavaScript, and this is where our uh, Vue.js app lives. So the server, again hosted on ASP.NET Core, has SignalR running, and we have a chat hub, and we'll look at that in a second, but I wanna show you the client bits first. So we're consuming a SignalR hub connection builder, and we're pointing to that same uh, chat hub, right? And we're gonna build that out and that's our connection. We can then use that connection to connect to the server. And we have a new view uh, application targeting that element. This is the ID of that element. And we have some data. This is basically just state within the context of our application. Messages, a little map of those, a current user, whether or not the user is typing, um, some emojis. And we even have notifications for when like a user logs on. Uh, we have a watch. This is unique to Vue.js. This allows us to uh, basically watch when the message chains, uh, changes. So when the user is typing a message in their chat window, we can debounce that such that we won't send off a, a communication until after 750 milliseconds. So it's a way to kind of buffer um, and, and wait for them to stop typing. And we'll use that actually uh, to communicate to other users that a user is typing. So within Slack, who's seen that little kind of type ahead, you know, like where people are typing? And who's watched that with angst 
and said, they're typing, they're typing, they haven't, you know, they stop, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, when are they gonna hit enter? Are they editing this? Like what's going on, right? Um, so I do that a lot, probably worry too much. And then we have some other things that we compute, right? We'll have some flashing text. Um, we'll get which users are typing. Uh, we have some messages here, or methods here so we can post the message. We can set whether or not the user is typing. Um, just a bunch of little things that allow us to interact with our HTML, right? So we can edit, we can receive the message, we can send them off. Um, let me see here real quick. So we can, uh, down here we have the connection object. So we walk up to the connection and we say dot on and we give it a method name. So on this connection, once it's established, we'll handle this event, the message received event, as follows, right? We get the JSON payload, and then we'll walk up to our app in context, which is our Vue.js application on the client. And we know that it has messages, so we can set the messages from the JSON payload, right? The, the message has an ID, and then the message itself will nudge the app to tell it to, hey, re repaint the screen. Um, if it's an edit or if it's from a, uh, a chat bot, we'll do certain things, right? One thing I'm giving away here is that if it's from the chat bot and we're saying it's a joke, our chat bot is actually going to speak to us, right? So it's not just gonna be a message that shows up. And how we're doing that is with some native JavaScript. So browsers today su support uh, speech synthesis. So we can give it a message, we can get some voices. I'm saying any Google US English voice here, and then we'll tell it to speak. Uh, so let's look at the chat hub itself real quick. Inside the chat hub, again, this is the strongly typed class that we're mapping to that chat endpoint. And as I mentioned, we're a subclass of hub. Hub is coming from ASP.NET uh, SignalR. And we have some dependency injection here. We have a command signal. This is how I'm figuring out whether or not a message is actually a command, right? So I can command my chatbot explicitly. I can tell it jokes and it'll start randomly saying jokes, right? So we're overriding onConnected. And onConnected is a function that occurs within hubs, so we can override that. And then we have this uh, collection of clients, right, in our hub. These clients uh, are all the connected clients to the hub at that particular time uh, of connection. So I can say caller, and caller is explicitly, it's kind of used as an echo. So a caller is the caller of the connection at that point in time. So when we're connecting, we can pump a message back out to the caller. So we can say, you know, hi, username, this is the chat application powered by SignalR. We treat it as a greeting, and we have the user as just a waving hand. The other thing that we'll do is we'll broadcast out to others. So others is everyone, every connected client, other than the individual that initiated that connection uh, method invocation. And that's when we're gonna say user logged on. So other clients that are on the chat application, we'll get a little toaster that says, hey, so-and-so just logged on, right? So that you could potentially start messaging them if you wanted to. The same is true with disconnections. So we'll walk up to others and say that, hey, this user just logged off. And then this is how we go about posting a message. So we're given a message, and if it's not a command signal, we'll return. Otherwise, we're going to broadcast that message out to all. And we'll just pass along uh, the message with some other information. And if the user is typing, we have the username in context already, so we'll just broadcast that out to everyone else to let them know that that user is typing. And that's pretty much that, so let's run this. So as we see here, we got our initial greeting, right? So signal R we already know is wired up. The request to the server happened. Uh, the server responded with our server side rendered CSHTML. So Razor Pages kicked in. It did its thing. We have our 
uh, HTML on the client here. And then the client did some other stuff where it went and asked for some JavaScript, and then our Vue uh, JS application spun up. It established that connection, right, to that endpoint on the server for the chat hub. And then it said, okay, now we're connected. So on the server, that unconnected event occurred. And then we broadcast out a message to whoever's online. So they'll get a message that I just logged on. And then we also kicked back a message, right, via uh, clients.caller. This is like an echo. So now I can see, hi, David Pine 7. Uh, this is the chat application powered by Signal Arms. So that's pretty cool, right? So now it's just, just a chat app, right? We can go up here, we can edit this, blah, 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 blah. Right, we say it's edited. Uh, other people can come in here. I'm alone though right now, so that's kind of depressing and sad. Don't feel bad for me. As I mentioned before, I added that hosted service. So there's actually a background service, and as I showed with the post message, there's a command signal waiting. So I, as a consumer of this, who have some uh, underlying knowledge of the system, I can walk up to this and post a message called jokes. Before I hit enter, I'm gonna to explain to you what it's gonna do. So jokes is gonna walk up to that post message. It's gonna be recognized as a command signal, right, in our hub. And then it's gonna start off the hosted service in the background. It's gonna say, hey, I know you're sitting back there. Uh, start, start telling me some jokes. Those jokes are gonna come in. We're gonna get type ahead saying that the joke bot is typing to us. And as those messages come in, they're gonna be spoken to us. Sound good? They're dad jokes, by the way. I adopted my dog from a blacksmith. As soon as we got home, he made a bolt for the door. <laughs> yeah, but it's right. And it's random. So every five to 30 seconds, the dad joke bot will start giving us new jokes. And what that simply is doing is it's using the HTTP client to walk up to I can has dad joke. It's a free API service that exists. Do you want a brief explanation of what an acorn is? In a nutshell, it's an oak tree. <laughs> yeah, they don't get any better. Uh, <laughs> but there's a free service for that, so we just basically tethered together a string of all these interesting technologies seamlessly, right? We have a, a full chat application. We can host. Why was the picture sent to prison? It was framed. <laughs> all right, I'll stop. <laughs> Again, the jokes don't get much better. Uh, but yeah, so we basically put together this application pretty seamlessly. It supports, uh, it's, it's up in Azure. I'll give you a link for that. Um, but it's pretty powerful how we can utilize these technologies. And collectively, this is the entire app probably under 500 lines of code, and we're doing all these things, right? Is that pretty cool? So just to recap, we saw Razor Pages there utilizing Vue.js. That was the JSON protocol. We're gonna get more into protocols in a bit. Uh, and this was actually using the Azure SignalR, so we could scale uh, seemingly endlessly, right? We could handle um, a lot more scenarios. And feel free to take a picture of this bit.ly. This is the link to the Azure hosted version of this application. And since you know the command, you can go show this off to your friends and say, check out these amazing jokes that are hysterical, right? So we looked at hubs. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll show the bit.ly again at the end with all the resources, and I'll share this on my Twitter also. So when we start thinking about hubs, hubs are like the central piece. They are the proxy betwixt the server and the clients. This is how the server and the client can communicate, right? And again, it's a duplex communication. So the server can send stuff to the client. Once that connection is established, and vice versa. So it's really, really powerful. So all the things that you're thinking of right now, those are things that you can do with this. So in the previous example, one thing you might have noticed is that we had a chat hub and we had some magic strings on the server, right? We said message received, like a string literal. And some people are against magic strings. Uh, some people are okay with them. One thing that you can't do is you can't alleviate those on the clients. But from the server, they do offer up strongly typed hubs. And those can be hubs of T, where you give it an interface. 
And then that basically changes what's available on that client's object, such that you can have the interfaces implementations to handle those communications. So I wanted to talk a bit about some of the different offerings and how we can specify, right? How granular can we get with the communications that we're pumping through Signal R, right? We have this clients, which is again, a collection of all the clients connected at that point in time. Uh, so if we wanted to broadcast, right? Imagine a broadcast scenario, much like what we were seeing when we type a message in a chat, right? We'll send that to all, right? So that's broadcasting to all the connected clients. So this is me, Dave, on the sender. So when I say, here's a message, the server, the chat hub will get that and it will regurgitate it to everyone, right? See how the arrow goes between me and the server. So I'm sending it to the chat hub. The chat hub is then saying, bam, here it is to everyone, okay? So the echo, that's how we basically got that um, unconnected event we called back to the caller, right? So that's how we got that little greeting message. So I'm connecting to the server. I'm connecting to that chat hub. So we can say at that point in time, we're gonna refer to this as like an echo, right? So we're walking up to the caller. Whoever initiated that request will, will be able to target them. So that's, that's me, right? So I connect to it. The chat hub says, here's something, right? We can send it to others. This is how we can broadcast when people connect, uh, right, or sign on. You don't wanna know that you signed on because you've just signed on, right? So we'll send it to everyone else to let them know that you did sign on. So that's others. So notice how the arrow doesn't come back to me. So Dave sends it to the chat hub. The chat hub then propagates it to all the other people. We can send it to a group, right? So imagine uh, not, not unlike what Slack offers, right? Where they have the notion of channels or HipChat will have like rooms. Is HipChat still a thing? <laughs> so, right, they have rooms. Those are basically just groups. Those are little, little ways that we can uh, communicate and, with that. So you'll give it a group name and you can send a targeted message of any type to a group. So in a chat, uh, chat application, Imagine that I wanna send something off to my friends, um, Maggie and Rachel, who are on the UX team. So they're part of UX, so I could send a message to UX, and I don't even have to be a member of that group. We can do direct messages. This is probably one of my favorite to talk about, because who hasn't done direct messages? And if you say you haven't, you're lying to yourself, because everyone talks crap about other people, so. <laughs> Right? So you can target an individual user this way, right? If you have their user ID, you can say you're gonna send them a direct message. And in this case, I'm messaging Maria. So I send a message, the chat hub gets it, and it then propagates it directly to Maria. So I mentioned before protocols and how the chat app I wrote was using JSON. So JSON is obviously text-based, it's human readable, it's nice to have uh, if you're you know, debugging and you wanna ensure like a payload, right? You can open up the network tab and you can see those messages coming over the wire. And since they're in JSON, you can inspect them and you can see what they look like and you can handle them appropriately. Uh, but since it's text-based and it's human readable, it's potentially bloated. So there's some optimizations that you can consider with the various protocols that are available. In this particular case, message pack. So message pack is binary. And it's roughly, roughly 60% uh, the size of a JSON payload. So 40% savings is pretty nice, right? So the SignalR protocol is, it's basically a protocol, like I mentioned before, for two-way RPC, right? Remote procedure calls over any message-based transport. So these are the two current implementations of those uh, protocols. Since it's open source and since they do have an official spec, you can go out there and implement your own, right? You can have like an emoji based one if you wanted to, for whatever reason. So we have another demo. And in this demo, we're going to 
uh, we're going to look at a different type of application. Um, some people had mentioned earlier that one of their favorite talks at NDC Minnesota 2019 was uh, WebAssembly and Blazor. So this is a Blazor application. And what I decided to do was to switch it up a bit. So some of the advantages of what Blazor was offering is this notion of solving the problem that exists with spa applications today where they're in JavaScript. I mean, that's not the problem, obviously. Uh, the problem is you know, marrying up APIs, right? So whatever technology your web API is built in, it has a model that it's going to uh, send back. It's gonna, it has a response, right? That payload has a defined structure. And if you write ASP.NET Core Web API, you can imagine having a C Sharp class that represents that. And if you have, for example, like an Angular application or some other you know, JavaScript thing, how do you marry up those types, right? How do you marry up what the, the Web API is sending back and what the uh, JSON is being parsed as, right? That, how, do you, how do you map that up? That's kind of hard to manage, right? Because things can change. So with Blazor, what they're doing is they have this notion of .NET running in the client browser. So since it's .NET, you have a C-sharp class or C-sharp um, capabilities, right? So you can share your models. So the models that are coming from the web API can be the same models that are receiving it on the, the client, right? Like, what? It's amazing, uh, if you're into C-sharp, of course. So let's take a look at this. We have the server side bits. Um, and in here, on the server, we're adding SignalR. We're adding message pack, uh, message pack protocol. This is where I'm explicitly stating that my protocol is not the default, which is JSON. It's going to be message pack. So this is the binary stuff that I mentioned before. And then we have uh, a Twitter service. So we're registering uh, Twitter. So I'm kind of giving you a hint about this application. Great, it's Blazor. Great, it's got SignalR. But what are we going to do with it? So what I've decided to do was consume a Twitter SDK. And we're going to do some streaming with it. So in our application, uh, when the server starts up, it's going to start listening for a set of handles and hashtags. And it's going to be streaming. So as those hashtags or handles occur on Twitter live, right? think again real-time web, as they occur, uh, an event will fire. And that event will occur on the server. And then we will propagate that with SignalR up to the client, which is a .NET application which is going to be listening for those events as well, right, via SignalR. And then we'll paint them on the screen, right? So it's kind of like a poor person's Twitter, so to speak. So let's take a look at a little bit more of this. So we are using SignalR. I'm specifying that I want WebSockets uh, or long polling as a fallback. So I skipped over server sent events just to demonstrate that capability. And then we have a stream hub. We'll look at the stream hub. Um, well, let's just look at it right now. So the stream hub is basically just utilizing the decorator pattern here. And we're consuming that Twitter service. And we're expressing some capabilities, right? So we're removing tracks and adding tracks. Tracks are synonymous with handles and hashtags in Twitter uh, for this Twitter SDK. And then we're saying that we want to start the tweet stream. And then we can pause it and stop it. So let's look at what the, the tweet stream stuff is actually doing. So we wire up to a bunch of events with our filtered stream from the Twitter SDK. And then once we uh, get one of those events to fire, we'll, we'll take this action. And we can. Um, basically create an embedded tweet and then send that along to the hub context. So this is not uh, an actual hub. No, this is the context of the hub. So it's slightly different. So our service doesn't have direct contact to the hub. We have the context, so it's a contextual hub. So we can still do similar things with it. 
So let's look at our client side bits real quick. Over here we have some markup. This is again CSHTML. It's pretty simple, 70 lines of markup. And with the help of Bootstrap uh, and some layout, we have uh, basically all of those tracks, the aforementioned tracks laid out. So we'll have the handles and the hashtags. And then we have start and stop buttons. And then as uh, tweets come in, right, we have tweets here. If there's any tweets, we'll basically for each over those tweets, we'll render them as a markup string and plot them in our list. Okay, so pretty straightforward. The code behind, right, the Blazor component for that has just the hard-coded um, read-only list right now of those tracks. So this is your clue as a consumer of this talk. If you're on Twitter, now might be a good time to pull out your phone and start typing in some of these hashtags, potentially getting ready to take a picture because it's going to show up on the screen. So we're injecting the stream service, and this is our client-side service. This is how we are connecting to um, the, right, we have the hub connection builder uh, with that URL, and we're also using message pack, right? And so from here, we're saying we're going to start that connection, and much like we saw with JavaScript, it's very similar in terms of like the naming conventions. We could say connection dot on tweet received, and this is our, our function, which is just basically a tweet result uh, returning a task. This is our handler. And this is how we're going to take those tweets and kind of build them up inside our components list. And then as, as that happens, we'll paint them on the screen. So let's run this. <clears throat> I'm going to pull up my phone and prepare a tweet. Six 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 five five six five five two. Okay, that's gonna load. Loving the developer community here at NDC Minnesota. Blah 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 blah. So you can see the application, right? We were listening for hashtag developer community, hashtag signalar, hashtag uh, NDC MN um, ASP. Uh, .NET, my handle, all these things, all right? Oh, look at that! Someone's already chiming in. Cool. I'm gonna take a picture of myself here. You guys give me some like metal horns, like something like, yeah! You guys are excited to be here. Sweet. Okay, I'm gonna tweet that. Bam. That should come through momentarily. Now, as that tweet's coming through, again, what's happening is the server is listening using the Twitter SDK. That's you guys, right? It's using the Twitter SDK. It's listening for those events, those ha uh, handles and hashtags. Uh, as those events occur, they, they come through that hub context where I can propagate then to the Blazor uh, side and say, hey, this tweet occurred. Here it is, right? And it's awesome. Ooh, and this one's not loading well. Um, so one of the things, when I shared that I was building this out, I thought it was a pretty compelling demo. And someone said, that's a great idea. But actually, it's not a great idea because you're an idiot. And I was like, wait a second, why? Right? Oh, man, my feelings were hurt. And I was upset by that. So as it turns out, someone had already done something similar to this, where they tried encouraging the audience to do live tweets and up their you know, morale or whatever. But uh, they're like, someone rained on my parade. Someone uh, put a tweet that came through that said something that was you know, potentially sensitive. That might have been offensive to others. And it just wrecked the vibe, right? Everyone was super distraught by that. So just be aware of it. And I said, well, I can do something about that. So what I did was, in my application, as tweets come in, and before I broadcast them off, uh, the, the SDK itself, the tweets, uh, they have a is potentially sensitive bit. Right? And that's coming from Twitter. So I'll trust Twitter that uh, I'm sure, if, based on how your account settings are, you might have seen that. So I said, great, I'll, I'll queue on that. And if it is potentially sensitive, I'll take it a step further. What I did was I integrated the sentiment analysis from ML.net. So if you haven't seen that, that's a machine learning.net SDK that you can then download and use uh, in your applications. So on the server, 
if I receive a tweet that's potentially sensitive, I'll run it uh, against this machine learning algorithm for its sentiment. And if the sentiment is predicted to be less than ideal, I'll just completely ignore that tweet. I've been really tempted to put a breakpoint here during these demos to say, bring it on. Let's see what you guys can do and see if I can actually you know, kick it out. But it's just a theory, so don't actually try that because something might sneak through. But it's pretty cool, right, that we can do that. Well, this is definitely not my talk, but apparently Amy's killing it. But right, we, we're queuing on those things, and it's awesome. All right, let's close that. Cool. So just to recap, that was ASP.NET Core plus Blazor. That was using the message pack uh, protocol, so again, that's binary. It might make things a little bit quicker, uh, less payload over the wire. It was utilizing the Twitter streaming uh, SDK, and that's the bit.ly for it, and that's the link to the source code itself. So if you have a Visual Studio and you want to go play with it, you can literally go download this and start running it and seeing how all the things are uh, kind of put together. So it's worth mentioning performance, right? We had just talked about message pack and some of the things you might want to consider when you start analyzing how you would use SignalR, right, the benefits. Uh, so with ASP.NET Core, uh, who's been following some of the Tech Empower uh, benchmarks? So it's pretty impressive to see that, uh, as of just recently, they had passed seven million requests per second. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second, because that is like, holy cow, that's insane, right? That's crazy to think about that. I think they're like what, like the top, in the top three or something like that for web servers and, and processing speed. So it's really, really impressive what they're doing. Um, but once I share this deck, you'll be able to look at not only the ASP.NET Core benchmarks, but also the SignalR benchmarks. And those benchmarks, this is a link here. I don't want to dive into it too much. But basically, it takes you out to a Power BI, and it's aggregated all of the Azure services, um, SignalR's uh, performance. So you can actually see the performance, and you can start comparing, like, what's the message pack um, protocol doing versus JSON? Or what about WebSockets versus server sent events? And how does that look? And right, you have all the data there to start making these kind of performance-based decisions about how you want to approach developing a solution. Uh, it's really nice to mention that they actually have a spec. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the talk, ASP.NET Framework, uh, SignalR has been around for like nearly a decade, and it was amazing, um, but now with ASP.NET Core's vision of it, the rewrite, they actually took a step back and said, let's do this uh, a little bit more uh, iteratively, and they introduced uh, a formal spec, right? So the SignalR protocol, it's the protocol for the RPC over any message-based transport. So you can, with the specifications, you can look at the hubs, you can look at the protocols, and you can follow the spec and again, you can implement your own versions of these things, but it's nice to see how under the covers that they have like an actual spec, right? So we have a final demo. Let's close this. So over here we have, uh, this application is another Another uh, look at kind of one-upping what Microsoft had done in terms of demos and stuff like that. So they, they had written, um, you may have seen it, but there's uh, Stream, Streamer, StreamR. Uh, it's basically like a, an ASCII art, taking the video camera, turning it into ASCII art, and then you can you know, view and watch and it's streaming. And, I, I rewrote that, but rather than relying on some of the third-party libraries, I, re, I wrote it by hand, because why not? It's JavaScript. What, how, how bad could it be? And I did it in Angular, so we, we were leveraging TypeScript. So let's take a look at this real quick. Again, very, very common nomenclature for our startup. We have uh, spa static files, right, because we are an Angular application, but then we get to the familiar bits of adding SignalR and the message pack protocol. And then down here, we're gonna configure how we're gonna use that. And then we have a, a stream hub, right, on this stream endpoint. And then here's our stream hub. 
This has a stream service, and our service, uh, this is where things get a little bit more interesting. So rather than just straight up messages, SignalR is offering like true streaming capabilities. They added some new uh, primitive types. So they have channel readers and channel writers, and those are kind of lower level uh, implementations that allow you to read and write uh, with like stream semantics. So let's look at our service. Our stream service has a concurrent dictionary of a string and a stream reference. We can list those streams out, and then we have a way to execute a stream. So this is basically starting a stream. So imagine our client app. We're gonna take a look at the client side bits in just a second, uh, but we're going to have um, the capabilities of our server um, starting a stream given a channel reader. So it's gonna be able to read from that. All right, so the stream will wait to read async, and then it's gonna to try to read them out, and then it's gonna for each over each of those references and then write back to all of the writers. So this is basically all the things that are listening on that. And then enter Angular, right? So we have some markup, we have a home component. Uh, this is only 49 lines of code here. But we have a way to share a stream, uh, given a stream name, then we have the capability of streams kind of being broadcasted to us so that SignalR will communicate, here's these streams that others are broadcasting. So you're a client, uh, you open up the URL in your browser, and you want to share your stream, uh, it'll list on other you know, clients' uh, browsers. So they can click on it and say they want to watch your stream. So that's the available list here. And then the component itself, I will admit that it gets very complexing. Again, I don't know why I decided to write this all by hand, but I did. Uh, so basically, we have um, child uh, elements within the context of our view. We're getting element reference. These are elements to the DOM. So we have the video elements, we have canvas, we have ASCII, and the ASCII is a pre-tag, so it's you know, monospaced, looks like code. And then we have uh, those actual elements, and then we have a canvas rendering 2D context. Then we have a subject. This is not to be mistaken with RxJS's subject. This is SignalR's subject. And this is what we'll map over to a channel reader. So very much like we've seen before, the client will new up a hub connection builder. We're gonna say we want the message pack protocol against the stream URL. And then we have a way we can broadcast and handle uh, when streams are created and when they're removed. And we have some error handling here for when it closes, we can re reconnect. We have our various characters. The one thing you'll notice about the characters here, these ASCII characters are basically weighted by the, the amount of space that they fill up. So on the far left, uh, this is gonna occupy more space, uh, whereas a dot will not occupy that much space. And that's how we're gonna map over individual data from uh, each frame. So let's go show you that real quick. So when we start the web camera, uh, we're gonna basically, this is all native JavaScript, so we're asking for the media services that are available, and then we're going to um, basically start wiring up how we're going to connect to the camera. And then we're going to, uh, let's, we're gonna draw frames. So what's really happening here is we have a canvas element, we have our video element. We're taking the source from that video stream, right, from our, our local webcam. We're plotting it on that canvas. And then every 150 milliseconds, we're taking an, a capture, like a one single frame of that uh, canvas at a point in time. And then we're asking for its nata, uh, native data, right? So there's each individual pixel. We can iterate over each individual pixel and we'll run it over an algorithm that says, hey, how does this, like what's the color depth, how does this look, and then we'll plot it and give it a specific ASCII character, right? And then that's what we're gonna assign to our pre-tag. So we have ASCII art from a video stream. So I'm gonna start this real quick. Um, and it's pretty cool to look at. It's not necessarily ideal, uh, but it's a way to do uh, like pseudo streaming of ASCII art because why not?
So 44385. Wait for this to load. And I'm going to load up two different browsers. The reason I'm doing two browsers is to demonstrate that one will be able to start creating a stream, right? So it's ASCII art, and it's going to pump that string through SignalR. And then we're going to say that, oh, streams showed up on the other side, and they can start consuming them. Right, so let's take a look at that. Here's NDC. Actually, let's do this way. NDC. Over here, we're gonna start streaming. Wait for it. I'll throw it over here on you guys. Oh, that's the wrong camera. Ah. Hi. Okay. So over here, we got that stream. We're gonna watch it. And just like that, we're broadcasting, right? So we're able in one browser to consume and one to, to publish, right? So it's pseudo streaming with ASCII art because ASCII art is amazing. There's no better way to, to view a video stream, right? Is that pretty cool? <laughs> All right. Let's see how much time we have. Perfect. OK. So a recap, that was ASP.NET Core with Angular, right? And then we did message pack again, but it's, it was basically um, a video ASCII art pseudo streaming and kind of demonstrating how you can use channel readers and writers and what that looks like. And again, it's just uh, all, all the different things that you can do or, or think of, you can probably do with SignalR. So it's just trying to find a specific use case for it. This is the resources that I mentioned before. The first bit.ly there is the live app. Uh, up in Azure. The second and third bitly is the GitHub repository for the source code. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll be sure to tweet out uh, all the other locations for the stuff that we cover today. I'll let people take uh, uh, pictures here. Awesome. And with that, thank you so, so much for having me. It's been an honor to come to NDC, and I'm humbled by all the people here, and thanks again. I'll be around if you have questions. Thanks. And be sure to vote. Sessions. You can put red, yellow, or green. Hopefully green.